Welcome. This is Alistair Knott. Tonight I've got a very special guest. I have really been excited to have him on this program. I really admire his work. I really love his YouTube channel. I think you will too. He is a YouTube creator that has over 2.7 million views. Absolutely astonishing. He puts out great content. He's the founder of the Sect of the Horn God, which was formed in 2011. So he's got staying power. He's been around for a while. He knows what he's talking about. He's got a website called the Sect of the Horn God.com. He has an Instagram page and he's got a Facebook like group. This group has approximately 27,000 followers. Very impressive. Please welcome Thomas Leroy. Thomas, thank you so much for spending time with me tonight. Thanks for having me, buddy. I tell you, I've been looking forward to this for some time. I'm, I'm a big admirer, uh, subscriber to your YouTube channel. You always cease to amaze when it comes to those videos. Very uplifting, uh, good content, really thought-provoking. I, I really I love those. How long exactly. have you been on the left-hand path, Thomas? I'm a little older than I look, and I've basically been on the path since the late 70s. Um, well, my story, okay. I'm, I'm a San Francisco native, and as a child, like most of us here in the United States, you know, I was my first... Um, let's say, uh, um, spiritual indoctrination was Christianity. It began with my mother, who was Catholic, and I barely remember that. Uh, I, I just remember the creepy iconography, you know, and, and the big churches and the stained glass and the creepy statues and the, and the priests speaking Latin and all that. Uh, and then I lived with my grandmother, who was Jehovah's Witness? Now that was that was that that I remember. That I remember. Uh, that was quite um, well. It was an experience. I'll put it that way. And then I was in a foster home, and they were Lutherans. And then after the foster home, I was with them for eight years. I lived with my father, and he was like he was a biker who just didn't give a shit. So as you can imagine, I was a bit confused as a child. <clears throat> so I went searching, you know, I was a seeker like so many other people. Uh, you know, when you're a teenager, you're lost, you're confused. And especially if you come from all these different interpretations of the same thing, you're bound to say, wait a second, you know, they're all supposed to be true and they're all vastly different. Come on. So I went looking and, uh, you know, and, and you come across shit like Wicca, you come across Crowley. Um, Crowley I liked, but I found him a bit confusing. You know, when you're 15, he's, he's a bit, he's a bit much. Even when you get older, he's still a bit much. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but then I found, I, I discovered Israel Regardi who had written books, of course, about Crowley, who was Crowley's, I'm pretty sure he was his last secretary, if you will, assistant or whatever. Uh, and his books helped to, in a sense, translate Crowley, helped to make, help. Crowley made sense through, through Regardi's books, for me at least. But then I was still, you know, still looking, checking out all this stuff. I, I couldn't relate to the, how should I phrase it? The, the pagan hippie moo moo dancing around in circles shit. That wasn't doing it for me. Uh, what was cool though is back in the back in the 70s in San Francisco, there were actual occult bookstores. Occult, real occult bookstores are hard to find now. Because most of it's like this new age stuff with paperbacks and so on and so forth. And yeah, you know, whatever. 
Uh, but there was this one in San Francisco, I forget the name of the store, which you would go in and it's filled, it's all wooden shelves, a leather bound, thick leather bound books. And that smell, you know, you know what I mean? That smell of old paper and leather. Yeah, oh, yeah, on. yeah. And then behind the counter, they had all these jars filled with who knows what, you know what I mean? For any sort of esoteric practice, a lot of candles, all that. I loved it. And then, of course, being from San Francisco, I knew who Anton LaVey was. Everybody in the city knew, him. you know, everybody in the Bay Area. You found his books practically everywhere. You, every bookstore had his book in there. Uh, I don't know what it's like in other parts of the country, probably not like that. Uh, surprisingly, though, you would find his books, you would find the Satanic Bible uh, in like the, the religious section, or, you know what I mean? And sometimes you'll say in the magical esoteric section, or whatever. And when you're little, all right, and you see that book, it used to creep me out when I saw it initially, but it, but it was kind of a fun scary thing you know now living in that foster home like i was saying uh, my foster mother she used to like to go shopping at the store that was on california street california street is where the black house was oh yeah That's, or yeah i think it was off it might i don't know if the store was on california or was off of california but anyway uh she would drive past the black house a lot and one time she finally, and she's, she's driving her and she's white knuckles going and she's looking over at the house and she goes, Tommy, an evil man lives in that house. And I thought, cool, evil man. <laughs> <laughs> but two and two together that the evil man was the guy who wrote that book, that creepy book. I kept on seeing in all these books. But eventually, <laughs> Yeah, eventually in my later teenage years, you know, being rebellious, I'm just, I'm, I don't, I think because I had sort of a chaotic childhood, been bounced around all over the place, foster home, juvenile halls, you know, all that shit, you tend to be a bit rebellious, you know, and the soft shit just doesn't do it for you. You know, if you live an extreme lifestyle, you want an extreme practice if you are a seeker. Uh, so I picked up the Satanic Bible, read it, and that's what put me on the path, basically. And it was about 17, 18 when I re read it. And that was, that was the beginning. And that's, and that set me off. I mean, it, the positive, the, see, what I got out of it, a lot of people don't get into it out of pure rebellion. And of course, there was a bit of that, you know, involved. But what it did for me is it taught me to live my life to the fullest. So I did all kind of, over the years, I did all kinds of crazy shit. I played rock bands in San Francisco, played clubs in LA. Then I went to Hollywood, did some acting, extra work, bit parts, you know, so on and so forth. And then finally started this, this, or, well, this organization, if you will, back about 12 years ago, 10 years ago. You know, it, it seems that the path for a lot of people is similar. You know, we want more. We're, we're wanting more than anything else that's out there. And I think that in yeah. itself makes us search, you know, deeper and dig deeper for that. And look Wonder. in the shadows where, where others are afraid to gaze. If you yeah. Will. Yeah, that's right. That's right. A lot of people are scared of that, don't you think? Oh, yeah, very much so. They're conditioned. Um, Western civilization is, it, well, whether we want to acknowledge it or not, are based on, let's say, two cities, uh, Athens and Jerusalem, if you will. And you, know, and you have the reason of Athens, but you have the, the religious, you know, Abrahamic faith of, 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 of Jerusalem. Uh, and that's that undercurrent of, of the duality of, of the good God, bad God. And that creates a duality in the human being. And you're taught, you're conditioned that that aspect, that, that darker aspect of yourself, that yin and yang thing, the darker aspect, you avoid it. And if you ever try to attempt to get in touch with it, well, you need 
You need Christ as a buffer between you and it instead of you getting to know it on your own terms, if you will. Absolutely. So you formed the sect of the Horn God in 2011. Can you tell us a little bit about what your philosophy is? Well, it's it's basically, okay, I use the, the archetype of the horn guy as a, an overall, let's say, symbol um, to encompass all sorts of, of different aspects of, I guess you can call the Prince of Darkness, um, that specific current that that is that let's say uh, Satan, uh, Shiva, even uh, Kali, Odin. Uh, a lot of people don't realize Odin's a very dark god. So on and so forth. They all fall with under that umbrella. And also a, a big aspect of the practice, or or. Um, the core idea of the organization is is to get to the primal, if you will. Try to go back, far back as possible, to try to find the origins of it, of it all, to try to try to obtain some truth. And also not only in history, but also in the psyche. Uh, basically, where that comes from is I, I'm the type, all right, like when I was playing a rock band, Let's say I would uh, I, I would get into let's say I I got into punk rock okay and then I would have to discover okay who influenced these guys you know it was Iggy Pop who influenced Iggy Pop so on and so forth and it's going back and going back until finally you know you're at Little Richard and you're going back further and you're going all the way back to Robert Johnson you know a hundred years ago practically you know what I mean right and that's right kind of what we're doing in this organization too is trying to find the earliest incarnations of the path, if you will, and, and leaving it more uh, wider open and let people decide, okay, which of these deities work for them? You know, which speak to them? Which of the mask of the archetype, you know, what it, uh, communicates to them directly, if you will? You know, that that really resonates with me because a lot of people are fixed on one particular entity right. and and they've heard the name and they've heard the description and they think, well, it's got to be like this, but it doesn't really have to be, does it? It, it can be a wide range, just as you said. You guys add some of the Eastern mysticism and some of those deities, uh, Kali and, and Shiva, as you said. Wow. I think that is that is great in keeping an open mind to what is there and what can be utilized. I think that's terrific. Yeah, exactly. I think it's, well, part of it too is, is there's a commonality, and few people realize this, between the let's say the brahmins of india and the druids of as far away as ireland from india if you will and that commonality is is the proto-indo-europeans now who is that original proto-indo-european -Indo horn god or darker deity i don't know no one's quite certain they have some vague notions but you see and that's and what is what was that original practice? You know what I mean? Uh, between that connects Druidism with Hinduism, if you will. And what's fascinating about Hinduism, which I love, is it wasn't it, it wasn't bastardized or or even basically fucked over by the Abrahamic faiths. They retained that tradition for, for close to five thousand years, where here in the West. We have to reconnect with that, with those ancient traditions, you know, those ancient occult practices, because of, as you know, the Middle Ages, which were, you know, just Christian fanaticism, if you will, and of course in the Middle East you had, you know, Muslim, uh, in, uh, excuse me, Islam sweeping through there, and just basically destroying that connection to the, to the ancient beliefs the ancient heritage, if you will, 
into pagan or whatever you want to call it, heathenry, if you will. So in your practice, do you perform rituals? Do you find rituals are important for your practice? We do. Yes, we do. We have uh, one of our key members. He is the, we call him the Hyperborean Hell Priest. The, uh, he's, he's called the Dark Fool. And he creates a lot of our, our rituals if I don't do it myself also. Um, but some members aren't that much into it. And that's fine. You know, some are. Uh, he's, as you can imagine, he's very much into it. Uh, yeah, rituals. Uh, some people are more into the meditative angle of it. Uh, some are in, more into the intellectual angle. Uh, study um, and so on. So it's up to the individual. Yeah, I, I agree. You know, there's there's a misconception. I think uh, this is my opinion, but I think there's a misconception when people say this is a solitary path. I think it's solitary because you have to find your way. It doesn't mean you're going to be a hermit. It doesn't mean you're going to be antisocial. It just means that ritual may be something that you want and need to feel fulfilled. Maybe not. I mean, that's that's what's great about this path, sure. left-hand path, is you can make your own way, and uh, and I think that's wonderful. That's wonderful. what the left-hand path is. That pretty much defines it right there. It is your path. It's like the analogy I use of, let's say, you have a, a god king sitting on a throne out in a, out in a jungle somewhere. You could take the, the nice paved road all the way to him and then jump in his lap and, you know, and cuddle up next to him. Or you can grab a machete, cut your way through it, and kick the fucker off the throne and sit your ass in. <laughs> and that's yeah. Basically, yeah, and that's basically, to me, that's, that's the left hand path. Wonderful. So you mentioned something on your website. Let me get this right. Rational occultism. Can you tell us a little bit about what that is? We venture onto the path through utilizing philosophy, psychology, mythology, and of course, you know, occult practices, you know, if you will. Um, and I think it's important to go into it with a rational mind because in truth satanism the path itself is not rational does not you know what i mean it, it's it's you have to be irrational yeah yeah you know, absolutely but what we do okay for example we have we have our different orders we call them the orders in truth are are our uh, courses and we start off with general Example, our first order is uh, the order of Pan, which is like basic Satanism. And then we have the order of Kernanos, which is the history of occultism, esoteric thought in the West. Uh, then we have the order of Prometheus. Now, Prometheus, that order is more science, critical thinking based. All right, because we don't want Kool-Aid drinkers. We don't want people, you know, just just believing for the hell of it. And they, you know, and they want put it this way: we want people who know how to think, because then after they go through that order, the order they're gonna they're gonna go into the order of Dionysus, and Dionysus is when you start getting into the irrational, if you will. And it's important to know where you stand, where, how your head works, before you delve into that. And then our final order, which is in some ways, well, we also have a new order too, the order of Iblis, but that's that's something special. Uh, our final, our, our highest is the order of Shiva, because in my opinion, Shiva is the, the epitome of left-hand path deities. Uh, even though Shiva isn't always perceived from the left-hand path perspective, in most cases, he, he, people go to him on the right-hand path. But there's some, the most extreme practitioners of the left-hand path, uh, 
go to Shiva, well, by taking that path. You know, that would be the Aghori, for example, who I find absolutely fascinating. Yeah. I don't know how much <laughs> I don't know yeah. how much of their practice I can actually, you know, feasting on, you know, human wastes and cannibalizing people and well they're already dead they don't kill them. <laughs> you know yeah they yeah fish them out of the, the ganges river you know what i mean and they right. their bodies and you know and and the idea is for them their uh, their eventual goal is to become well it is it is similar to that state that a human being would have knowing let's say they know they have like brain cancer and they only have a few months to live. And you go through those stages. And the final stage is complete acceptance of existence. And that's what they do by delving into the darkest, darkest aspects of existence, you know, of death, pretty much. Uh, they come to that, that wholeness, that, that feeling of oneness, if you will, with, with their eventual demise, even though they're hopefully not going to die anytime soon. You would get that, 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 sense of like wonder and appreciation for being alive and to me that's that's enlightenment that's where okay this is also what i like about the left hand path right hand path enlightenment is like a carrot on a stick you know what i mean it's dangled in front of you and it's always just out of reach Oh yeah. Well, if you, yeah. If you do this or, or just give us some more money or what, you know, you can get closer, you can get closer. This, I think, if you know what the eventual goal is, that sense of fulfillment, of acceptance, of existence, of life, so on and so forth, then you know what you're you can see the goal, which which you will eventually hit. I like that. That's that's a great description of how that works absolutely so you mentioned you have been in movies and yeah. and i just i'm so intrigued with that i actually watched one of your videos and you were talking about that experience uh, what did you take away from that experience and kind of tell us what you were in i'm sure people would be interested in that i started in the later 80s um uh, <laughs> I had I had relocated from San Francisco, San Francisco to LA. I uh, was playing in rock band, so on and so forth. And myself and two other friends were walking down Hollywood Boulevard, and these talent agents were looking for some looking for people for a commercial for Michelob beer commercial. It was, and they liked the way we looked and said, you know, you want to come and audition at this hotel. I forget where it was. Uh, tomorrow at a certain time. So we went down there, we auditioned, we got the part, and it was, it was this commercial. It, it, I don't know how long, it didn't air much, uh, but we were like rock stars getting off stage, walking down this ramp, and people are sticking their hands out toward us, and we're like high fiving and doing all that. <laughs> wow. That was one of the earliest things I I did, and then um, later on, most of what I did was during the '90s. Uh, some of the bigger films I was an extra in uh, uh, was the movie Heat with Al Pacino and Robert De Niro. Oh you yeah, see me in it, but it was the scene. Uh, it was a nightclub scene. I'm sitting at, at this table with three other people: with a girl, another guy, and another girl. And right next to us is the table where Al Pacino is talking to the rapper Tone Loke, if you remember him. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't know what he's doing now. But anyway, uh, in between takes, Al Pacino would come over to our table and start talking to us. I think he was flirting with the girls. Even uh, you know, even he asked me, he goes, "Hey, you want a stick of gum?" Uh, <laughs> nice guy. <laughs> and then what was what was kind of cool is they had it set up where I was going to do a scene with him. Basically, is the the shot of him coming into the club, and me going out of the club. And I would like subtly like bump, just a subtle bump of, you know, the shoulders and then walk past it. And we did multiple takes of it. So finally the assistant director came up to me and goes, oh, I'm sorry, but we can't use you. And I go, well, what's going on? Why not? And they go, cause you're making Al look too short. 
<laughs> I'm, I'm like, oh, roughly and he's, he's, he's a short guy. So they got a girl in to do that part. I'm pretty sure. Uh, but yeah, that was, that was one, uh, the more popular films, um, American history X was another big film that I think a lot of people are familiar with. And that one, you can see me in that one. It's a, uh, it's a scene where Edward Norton first goes to prison and he's in the, the cafeteria or whatever, the lunchroom, whatever you call it. And he's sitting down and you can see me behind him sitting down. I'm sitting down with the long hair, peckerwood, biker types. Uh, he's sitting with the white supremacist. Uh, other big films. Oh, one of the worst movies ever made. But fun to work on. Showgirls. You familiar with that movie? Oh, yeah. 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 Demi Moore, right? No, that was... Or... Uh, no, that was... Uh, God, what was that girl's name? I can't remember her name. She was in... Uh, what was it called? Saved by the Bell or something. One of those kids shows from the 80s. Okay. Um, and she was a strip... Well, she's going to, uh, to Vegas. And she wanted to be famous in Vegas and whatever. Uh, and then she wants to become a showgirl in Vegas. But first, oh, okay. she starts off as a stripper. Uh, well, the scene that we worked on, we, it was at Raleigh Studios on Melrose in Hollywood. And and when you do extra work, you're basically you're kind of you have a vague idea of what it's about. And all we knew was it was a club scene. Well, we walk into the soundstage and they created this complete titty bar, basically, you know, on the soundstage, 360 degrees all the way around. I don't know why they just didn't use a real club. But anyway, they had built this and they had all these stages set up with these gorgeous girls on these stages, completely naked, trolling around these poles, all this stuff. And I'm thinking, I'm, I'm sitting here getting paid for this. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. <laughs> and also, oh, here's another uh, little side story with that one. Uh, they had to do these scenes where, where guys were getting lap dances. All right. So what they did is they went around and they got guys who were like old or obviously gay. <laughs> because they were going to have these girls basically sitting on their laps for hours. And they didn't. And they didn't want guys <laughs> that would get too frisky, if you will. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, that one was fun. I worked on that for a few days. Uh, another one, Kurt Russell, Escape from L.A. Oh uh, yeah, the sequel to Escape from New York. Yeah, uh, you can yeah. see me in that one. Uh, it's where Kurt Russell first goes to. He goes down to Hollywood Boulevard. And the bad guy, que Quavo Jones, I think his name was, he's going down the street in a Cadillac. And the line is Kurt Russell's talking to Stacy Keach. And he goes, I'm watching the parade. And you see me walk past him, but you see me walk past him twice because they had screwed up in the editing. Uh, and I basically look the same as I do now. Um, what and also I I went on on auditions and because extra work, anybody can get anybody can practically be an extra. Trust me, they'll hire practically anybody because they just need bodies. But then after doing that for a while, I decided you know I'm going to try real acting. So I went on an audition for a movie called Acts of Betrayal, and it was the part of a motorcycle hitman on a dirt bike out in the the high desert area of Southern California. And I got the part. So my very first audition, I got the part. And I thought, oh, shit, this is easy. Well, no, it's not easy. Because after that, <laughs> I tried other auditions. It didn't work out all that great. But anyway, my very first audition got the part. And that movie came out on HBO. And it's called Acts of Betrayal. It stars Maria Conchita Alonso. She was in... The Running Man with Arnold. She was also in Predator, uh, yeah, Predator Two. Uh, Hispanic actor, super nice person. Meeting her in person. Um, anyway, I had this scene where 
I'm trying to kill her. I'm I'm trying to find her in a warehouse. And I have multiple, just there's multiple scenes, but that's my final scene. And I had this stuntman play me where he falls through these panes of glass and rolls over on the floor and so on and so forth. Because I, I get shot by the hero, you know, because I'm one of the bad guys. But anyway, yeah, that, that movie is actually, Acts of Betrayal is on uh, YouTube. So, and I pop up in the movie about 40 minutes into it, you know, and I'm there for like, I don't know, off and on for about 20 minutes after. Uh, and then I did another film, actual audition for a part, speaking, a substantial speaking part. This movie was called The Other One. Low budget, really low budget, but cool film in some ways. Uh, fun to do. I played a speed freak who stole rugs and was trying to pawn them off. Uh, and the basic premise of the story was the guy who wrote it and directed it and starred in it was obsessed with the Grateful Dead. And the, and the, and the, the term Grateful Dead comes from an old like European legend or something where this guy helped another guy, that other guy died and he came back from the dead and helped him out. And it's the Grateful Dead or whatever. Um, and this is a loose, modern interpretation of that that tale, if you will. And that, yeah, that was a lot of fun. And then uh, uh, life, you know, as, as life is, I, I got custody of my daughter. And I had to decide between Hollywood or raising my daughter. So there, there was no. Yeah. Oh, yeah. My daughter. So I had to unfortunately give up Hollywood, but very fortunately I got to raise my daughter. Uh, so, well, that's that's quite an impressive list. I mean, that that fascinates me that that whole process of making movies and things like that. I think that's that's cool. When you're young, and I was young and single, I just my wife, my first wife, and I, you know, we split up. I went. Like, fuck feeling sorry for myself. I'm going to go enjoy myself. So I went right back down to Hollywood because I had lived there a little earlier with my with the family. And then we re relocated up here to Northern California. And then things weren't working out. And I ended up back there. And I said, I'm going to, I'm just going to live life. I was in my 30s, you know, young. Fuck, I'm going to yeah. do it. I'm, yeah. I'm going to live to the fullest. And that came from being, I, Myself, I see it as coming from being on the path, you know, because that's the one of the major aspects is this. You have this, you have this thing called life, you know, get out there and fucking live it. Too many people sit around and they wait for this shit to fall into their laps and it never will. It never fucking will. You got to go out and do it. Absolutely. Like, you know yourself. I mean, you went out, you published books and so on. You've done your things, so you, you know. Absolutely. I mean, the the best thing about life is living it, you know. It, it sounds it sounds plus that simple. It is That's that simple. simple. Yeah, it's that simple. Absolutely. So now you were invited to speak at uh let's see, Flambeau Noir. Am I and, saying that correctly? I, I always yeah. mess that up. But it's uh, French for Black Flame or Black Torch or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was coordinated by Jeremy Crow. Yeah, and, uh, and as season, well. In season Cole, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with her. Uh, the, the two of them worked together to put this on. That was in 2018 up in Portland. Tell us a little bit about that. That was a gathering of left hand paths practitioners uh i did a lecture there were uh little booths set around in the hall um multiple people were there lecturing uh michael w ford who i got to know who's, who's an outstanding human being he and his wonderful wife uh my wife the four of us just hit it off really well and we got along great uh after well after the the initial conference or whatever it, it took place start on friday uh friday saturday and sunday and sunday night after the conference there was a party in the hall 
uh, had a few drinks, so on and so forth. And we back to the hotel and in the lobby of the hotel, uh, the four of us just stayed up and just talked for hours, just in the hall, just basically commiserate because we could relate to a lot of the same stuff, if you know what I mean. Uh, yeah. Dealing with people, so on and so forth. But yeah, they're an outstanding couple. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I I forget exactly what my, to- I think my topic was, what was it? I can't even remember now. It, I even put out a video of the lecture too. Uh, but in, yeah, it was uh, Shiva, something to do with Shiva and, and, and the connections between East and West, I believe, and so on. It was about 45 minutes of lecture. Yeah, and then some Q&A and so on. Yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. Met some outstanding human beings. Nice. But when you do something like that, you have to be careful to make sure, you know, the, the idiots don't show up. So, and they were very good about that. You know what I mean? Uh, uh, the people were sent their passes, if you will, privately. You know, it wasn't open to the public. Because you don't know what sort of night case would show up, and you know it's gonna, it's gonna cleanse the world of those evil, evil satanic heathens. You know what I mean? And open fire. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So that brings up a great question: Have you experienced hostilities in in your path? Have you had people attack you on the left oh, yeah. or the right path? Can you yeah. share a little about about that? Early on, um, when I, okay, I, I got into all this, uh, the internet aspect of the left-hand path, uh, 2009, and then I noticed something that I didn't like, is those who called themselves Satanists, because I thought initially, I thought, this is going to be cool, I'm going to be able to communicate with with people like-minded human beings. But then I discovered that most of them were fucking dicks because they would use it as an excuse. You know, you would hear shit like, like I'm uh, Satan means adversary, so I'm adversarial. Now, some people can do the adversarial thing correctly. There's a way of doing it. You know, you can do it with nuance. You know what I mean? Um, And then there's the, the little prickish, adversaries you know the those who are angry at mommy and daddy still, yeah you know I yeah mean? who who well i bet you a lot of them are now sitting in a pew somewhere you know i mean back in church yeah you know yeah they were they were throwing a temper tantrum you know what i mean and then yeah they're back home uh in a sense um those people Early on, I mean, just attack and attack. And it's like, and it's going back to that, you know, these are people that if you met them, you would probably get along with them initially. That's what they didn't realize. So I would make points about that, make that point over and over again. In a lot of my videos, I think, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? Why are you so fucking angry? You know, I can see initially feeling resentment when you first get on the path because you realize you know this 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 past you have of of christian indoctrination you know what i mean has frustrated you and so on and so on and you feel lied to i get that but you got to let that shit go if you want to uh, advance on this path otherwise you're just standing there at the starting line beating your fucking chest not getting anywhere uh, so yeah, we got that kind of crap from supposedly people on the uh, left-hand path, but then also on my on my YouTube channel, the comments on my YouTube channel. Oh shit! I had this one guy. I think he was, I think he was a Muslim, that said he was going to kill me and rape my wife. Oh so man! So that was like yeah. So that was like a quick like okay, report this guy. You know, I wasn't too. I wasn't too intimidated because I live way out in the sticks now in Northern California. It's not easy to get here. So, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so yeah, try to try to find it. Um, but most of the most of the people on the right hand path, most of the Christian types, they want to save my soul. So they're kind of gentle, and 
and then some of them, some of them, I actually thank. I said, thanks, thanks for the consideration, but I'm not interested. You know, and if they're polite, I'll be polite. If they're idiots, I'll treat them like they're an idiot. Uh, but all in all, it's it's been fine. Uh, oh, 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 yeah. There's another. Okay, now we lived on a winery. All right, that was destroyed by one of the many wildfires that came through Northern California. Uh, we had a little bookstore. We were, not only did we live on it, we were the caretakers on the winery. And we used to put on events. Now, we aren't going to put on a satanic gathering in rural Northern California. That's not going to go over well. Because rural Cal California is not unlike anywhere else in the U.S. And, uh, talking rural. Just because it's in California doesn't mean it's enlightened like San Francisco or LA. <laughs> no, no. These yeah. pit, a lot of these people up here are straight up hillbillies. So instead of a satanic gathering or whatever, we put on a pagan fest. We did a couple of them. And we would have protesters show up for that, you know, with their signs and marching through. And it's like, go ahead. <laughs> we don't give as long as you don't touch anybody. Right. You know, don't get in anybody's face, you know, do you march through and then get out of here. So, but all in all, it's, it hasn't been much of a problem. Good. Yeah. That's, that's something I've faced a lot and I know a lot of other people have too. And, you know, it's, I kind of, I adopt the same philosophy, you know, if, if people treat me not even with respect, if they just treat me like a person, then I'll give them the benefit of the doubt, you know, but sure. uh, there's a lot of people that just come right in. They want to save your soul. And when you reject that, then, you know, they want to, you know, start trolling you and, and having your, you know, your channel taken down and all this kind of stuff so those those people you notice how bad their writing is you know the punctuation spell oh yeah <laughs> yeah I, no I always, capitals I the little trick i do is i correct i correct their spelling yeah you know what I, mean? I go through and i edit basically and put it back in their face i love that <laughs> that is great you gotta, you gotta basically <laughs> laugh at it because I'm not gonna get angry yeah. and like, ooh, you know. So you yeah. gotta laugh at that shit, you know, because if they come off as idiots, it's like, it's like, it's like Mark Twain said, never argue, never argue with an idiot. He'll drag you down to his level and beat you with experience. Yeah, indeed, so, indeed, absolutely. <laughs> so is is the sect of the Horn God? Is it a, affiliated with any other groups? out there um not really uh there are some groups we admire uh we're not uh, we're not too crazy about tst if you know what i mean uh or yeah. the modern cos uh we do like uh the temple of set um zach black satanic international um i'm friends personal friends with zach um but yeah I'll, i like zach i'd like to have him on this program sometime i love his uh what was it called 30 hits of of, acid. of some yeah i mean yeah. it was just like mind-blowing it really was oh his his mind was blown <laughs> i <Literally>. bet <laughs> <laughs> Did you know the story though? It was like an eyedropper kind of and just pulled it out of a vial and just dropped it on his tongue. Yeah. Yeah. He, what would he say? He saw dolphins like swimming around in the air or something. And yeah. yeah way out. There. It was a trip. <laughs> yeah. He's a really good guy. He's really he has he has a very good speaking style. Very honest, genuine. Uh, yeah, I like I like Zach quite a bit. He lived on the winery for a while. He was up here with us. I think uh, I saw some pictures of you guys together in maybe a little temple or or a little yeah uh, yeah there was respite a little, there. There was, there was a little uh, there was a little chapel on the winery that uh, was well put it this way it was it was rarely used for Christian gatherings if you will. 
Nice. <laughs> there were a couple of weddings in it and so on. Yeah. But it was mainly we would take it over at night and bring in our own personal iconography and fill it up. And yeah, that place was great. I miss it. You know, it was six years ago. Uh, yeah, this month that it, yeah, wildfire came through, and destroyed everything. We had like just minutes to get out of there. Uh, wow. yeah. it was no fun. You guys, you get a lot of those those wildfires out there. Yeah, it was. It's a combination, of course. You know, climate change is legit, but there's in California no forest management, basically, or limited forest management over the past I don't know, thirty or so years because of some I don't know the, the winged wombat or something. I don't know some sort of animal. You know, we we can't do this because it might infringe upon their their habitat or whatever it's like well right. how many animals are getting killed by these fires right yeah you know I mean? these, these many millions of acres uh like my wife was just telling me right before i got on with you there's another fire going on just a few miles from us it's really smaller. most likely they'll put it out but we have literally fire season like right now we are in fire season so we're constantly on the lookout we hear sirens, wow. we go out and look, look for the puff of smoke. And it's a pain in the ass. I'm thinking about moving to Nevada where they don't have any trees. Yeah. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> That'll lower your fire hazard yeah. dramatically. So I always ask during a video, what advice do you have for someone that is looking at the left-hand path they're trying to find their way, just like all of us, and they're searching. What advice do you have for them? Get over your anger, first and foremost. Get over your anger. Uh, look at what you get into objectively. Don't be, like I said earlier, don't be a Kool-Aid drinker. Just don't dive in head first, you know, and expect all the answers and so on and so forth. Do your research and look at everything that's out there to offer. I mean, you can go from one extreme, like we had talked about the Agori. They're at one extreme. And then you can go to the other extreme of the path, in a sense, would be like the mythology of, of mythological um, of, of teachings of Joseph Campbell, which had a left-hand path bent to it. But it was like the softer left-hand path or the more extreme left-hand path and everything in between. Check it out and find what works for you because it's about you and it's about your personal journey because the end result is you going into your psyche, a place where only you can go. Nobody else can go with you. It's a solitary journey. Very wise words. Well said. Thank you for that. And the last question is, do you want to share anything with our listeners and our viewers that we haven't talked about tonight? Oh, well, we could go off. We could be on here for 10 hours. <laughs> We've got but, time. They'll stay think, with us. <laughs> <laughs> I think we could, we pretty much got the, the core of it uh, covered. Uh, I do want to mention, I think, uh, oh, I do want to mention my wife, uh, who's who's been, I mean, I'll put it this way, if it's not for her, she was, see, the sect was something I've been wanting to do, like something like this for a very long time. I'm talking like 30 years, maybe even more. Um, and she was that final ingredient, was her, and then getting online and doing the connections, you know, the online connections and so on and so forth, people. But it was her. She was that final ingredient. She was, she was my other half. Uh, she handles she handles stuff that would drive me fucking crazy <laughs> into this organization. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right, I, I right. have I uh, she's the one like okay she's she's at the beginning of all my videos. I, there's a picture of me and there's a picture of her. Uh, I go over what I'm going to do in that video with her. She's like the first person who hears what I'm what I'm going to say, and she'll tell me. Or, you know what I mean? Like, mm, uh, that sounds good. Then uh, uh, so much. She's like the, my first audience, if you will. I always go through it with her. 
So yeah, I definitely want to mention Lisa Kareem. She is uh, she's very very important to this well, organization. And wonderful. Me. Wonderful, and and I want to thank her as well because I had several emails with her, and uh, thank you very much to her, and uh, and thank you for sharing time with me tonight. I, I oh, really. Of course. It means a lot to me, you know, with this series, I'm trying to show people that there are other things and other people out there and, and they have experiences that they can share. And I thank you for being a part of that, Thomas. I really do. Oh, of course. Of course. It was great talking to you, buddy. You too, man. You too. And for those listening and viewing, this has been Alistair Knott. Hail Satan.